The experience that taught me to hear my passion whispering was breaking up at the age of 36 with the man who I thought was going to be my life partner. Sitting in a studio apartment with a bunch of cardboard boxes, I had to face a sobering reality. I had never learned to listen to myself. I couldn't hear my true desires and wants, and so I hadn't been able to bring my full self to the partnership. As I sat with this, I realized that at the root of my inability to hear my authentic inner voices was my sense that I was cut off from my passion. I don't mean passion as something explosive and fiery or extreme. I mean the steady, gentle burn for purpose and meaning. I had always been able to vaguely feel my passion knocking around in me somewhere. But whenever I tried to look straight at it, it was as if all I could see was a gray curtain. I needed to figure out how to draw that curtain aside so I could talk to my passion because I really needed to build my life around it. During my time in that studio, I found two effective practices that let me do this. The first one was to steadily draw back the curtain the second was to learn to recognize the sneaky ways my passion was escaping around the edges. Working steadily with these two approaches has gotten me to a very different relationship to my passion. It's not a perfect relationship, and working this way is not all easy. But being on the other side of what I've learned is distinctly a better place to be. Up till the breakup, I'd been looking for my passion externally by seeking the right context that would draw it out of me. When I was in eighth grade, there was this high school with a fierce reputation for assigning so much homework that students regularly slept only five or six hours a night. I desperately wanted to go there. At the time, I felt like I was less social and more serious than I was supposed to be. So when I got in, I prepared myself to lose sleep and suck it up because I was absolutely sure that in that context, my seriousness could blossom into passionate care and devotion. I got an excellent education at that school, but by the time I graduated, rather than having learned to how to connect deeply to my intrinsic passion, I had learned to better meet the expectations that others had for me and to focus on grades and external rewards. On top of this, I had become really competitive and judgmental. I figured my passion might still be hiding, perhaps waiting for a context that would elicit more service and contribution. After college, I joined the Peace Corps. This was absolutely a rich and educational experience. But even after two years learning and serving in a pretty remote place, I still didn't have a strong relationship with my passion. I tried again and again with different public service jobs and activism. These experiences were tremendously valuable, but none of them had the result I was going for. Establishing direct contact with my passion took on a new level of urgency during the time after that big breakup. I knew that I needed to get this communication online if I ever wanted to have a different kind of partnership and life. As I sat on my futon and tried to talk to my passion, what I heard instead were two other very loud voices. Judgment and attachment to outcome were amazingly proactive in criticizing my passions, given my passions hadn't even uttered a word. Judgment would come in and say, that's not something that smart and successful people want. That's not feasible or practical. That's selfish. Or simply, in all its nuanced wisdom, judgment might just say, that's dumb. Attachment to outcome would come in and add, what does wanting that even mean? Where would that lead? Who would collaborate with you on that? Or failing is the worst case scenario and it would mean an end to everything. So here's what I learned to do. I chose to have the faith that passion really was sitting behind the curtains. I could sometimes feel it as a kind of physical wriggling that might be half nervousness, but with also half excitement. Then I began to gently peel back the curtains of judgment and attachment to outcome. I came to see that judgment was trying to assign value to my passions before someone else had a chance to knock them down. It wanted to minimize, marginalize, and dismiss. When judgment offered its input, I kept drawing it to the side, focusing on that subtle wriggle of excitement and trying to let that feeling of passion brighten. 
when you're doing this, keep drawing judgments to the side every time they come in. Be gracious but firm. Thank you for sharing. No. Attachment to outcome was the other loud voice. This is the voice that refuses to invest without knowing its effort will pay off. It hates stepping into the unknown where passion will inevitably lead us. So tell it, thank you for sharing, but today I am just too curious about my passion to pay attention to you. With the voices of judgment and attachment to outcome consistently drawn to the side, my passion did begin to talk to me. It wanted things I had labeled as unreasonable and uncertain. It wanted to participate in collaborative emergent projects, in teaching for freedom rather than for mastery of content, and in community-scaled healing. I learned that passion doesn't present as a job description. It's more like a type of engagement with a broad aim. For me, there was no reputable or established path that my passions wanted me to take. Passion was asking me to tolerate the unknown, have faith in people, and give value to the qualities and desires that my society actively devalues. This practice did give me more access to my passion on its own, but when I paired it with the second practice, I knew I had gotten to a very new place in relation to my passion and purpose. During this time, I also began to learn about sideways passion. I realized that my true desires had been present during my relationship, but I didn't recognize them because they were escaping like steam through the cracks in the curtains. This sideways passion shows up as judgment of others. Passion escapes this way when we don't feel we have a good opportunity to express it directly. I knew I would need to make a practice of catching my judgmental thoughts and mining them for the precious information they held about my true desires and passion. I developed four reflective questions to help me do this. One, what am I labeling as wrong? Two, what value of mine is being violated? Three, why do I feel I can't act directly on that value? What am I afraid of? And four, what needs to happen for me to start acting directly on the value? Here's an example of applying this in my career. One of my most fierce and regular judgmental tirades was against my fellow teachers who lectured rather than facilitating discussion. How dare they? Don't they know they're disempowering their students? Haven't they read a single educational theory from the last century? Clueless, entitled. So I took this tirade, which was much longer than what I just shared, and worked through the questions. First, I was labeling the lecturing teachers as wrong. I wasn't saying I disagreed with their style, I was saying they were wrong. Second, the value I felt was being violated was my value of collaboration. Third, the reason I felt I couldn't act directly on this value was because I was actually holding on to an old belief system that if you're a brilliant teacher, you lecture. I was afraid that doing my interactive style would reveal to the world that I was unintelligent and I would be banished from the university as unqualified. Fourth, what needed to happen for me to act directly on my passion instead was to choose to trust myself Students were learning, my evaluations were positive. My teaching style came from theory I had learned in my master's program. I needed to let my passion for teaching and not my self-doubt lead me toward further growth and development. I learned that wherever in my life my passion came out sideways as judgment, there was a fear of not having something I needed. When my neighbor mows their lawn during work hours, I judge them harshly because I'm scared of not having quiet for my work, and ultimately, I'm afraid of failing in the work that I'm passionate about. When I judge people for wearing expensive, branded workout attire, I'm afraid of being seen as less than, of not being attractive, and of being alone when I so value connection. Asking the four questions shows me my fears, and it guides me to consider how I need to redirect my passionate energy. Fear is not the end of the story. Putting energy toward what I want and value is. Judging isn't nice, but that knowledge has never gotten me to stop. Only real understanding of my judgments has helped me. I know that if I want full access to my passion, I need to do this inquiry practice to get underneath my judgment. 
These two practices are for individuals, and that's where it starts. But I think it will become even more powerful when we scale these practices up and do them collectively. Drawing back the curtains individually means pulling aside judgment and attachment to outcome to reveal passion. Doing this collectively means supporting each other to value that in us which our society has taught us to devalue. Judgment wastes our collective power. When we police ourselves by judging ourselves, we are holding back the parts of us that want to do things differently, to make a break from the past and forge a new path. When a lot of us judge ourselves in patterned ways, we give life to the large-scale, oppressive judgments that live in our culture. If we can engage in the process without fixating on the outcome, we can free ourselves up to contribute to things that are far bigger than we are. We allow the possibility that our work will make room for others to do their work, that we will create a space into which the next generation can step. If we could control our way to a positive future, we would have done it already. We can also engage in a collective version of the second practice and locate our passion gone sideways, calling it back together. We can decide that judging others is not a good use of our passion. Underneath our judgments and righteous indignation lives our deep intelligence about what matters to us. We can talk about this in our communities and organization and create new norms around judgments. Our practice is to make our bodies into spaces where judgment cannot take hold, take root, or thrive. If we do this, then we can be part of a body politic that does not allow judgment to take root in our collective spaces and in our shared decision making. We become people who can hold space for the things that we actually want, like community and wellness and justice, rather than judging these aims as naive or impractical. Instead, Let's take all of that audacity, let's gather it up and use it to fuel the envisioning of our shared future. Thank you.